This program was made possible by a grant from the Pennsylvania Public Television Network. The network receives funding from the Commonwealth to provide public television to all Pennsylvanians and by viewers like you. Thank you. Oh, Jim Crow. Oh, why you've been brave. Oh, down in Mississippi. Oh, and back again. Oh, Jim Crow. There's a lot of amnesia, especially in the North, about questions of racial inequality. Uh, discrimination in past and in present. Northerners define themselves as not the South. We aren't, you know, the hooded Klansmen and the uh, violent racists of Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana. What's wrong with you? Most Americans think that the discrimination that resulted from Jim Crow was a Southern convention that it only affected blacks in the South and not those above the Mason-Dixon line, which forms Pennsylvania's southern border. But that's simply not the truth. Jim Crow thrived in our Commonwealth, too. And this is the ranch home in Levittown that we decided on. And it had three bedrooms that we needed. It had uh, an oversized garage and uh, we liked it very much. You've been around too long. The salesman for Levitt would not show a home to a black family. In other words, they wouldn't even let you look at it. Housing and job discrimination are only part of the story. Pennsylvania has also been visited by the very real horrors of lynching. Lynching could and did include being burned alive. Now it's all over now. Mr. Walker was lynched. He was lynched. And there are so many marks along the way where people who were trying to clear this up knew that the man was lynched. Oh, Jim Crow. Historians say the term Jim Crow was introduced by Daddy Rice in minstrel shows. It eventually came to mean Negro. Often associated with the Deep South, these mean-spirited caricatures of blacks performed to huge audiences all over the world. Many of the images that embodied Jim Crow supported the idea that blacks were inferior buffoons, fawning servants, and savage menaces to society. Black children were portrayed as pickaninnies, barely human, and often no more than alligator bait. Even one of Agatha Christie's most famous murder mysteries was originally titled Ten Little Niggers. Once blacks were reduced to cartoons, it was an easy reach to codify laws reinforced by these images. In the South, these ordinances were originally known as the slave codes, but eventually were just referred to as Jim Crow laws. They reinforced segregation and prevented blacks from enjoying most public accommodations that white Americans took for granted. It's all over now. But Jim Crow was not just a Southern institution. In 1875, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional. Nationally, blacks had no rights to ride in public conveyances on land and or water. Under the same ruling, blacks also had no rights to attend theaters or other public places of amusement. Jim Crow had reached far beyond the South and had spread well past the Mason-Dixon line. It's all over now.
Dr. Thomas Segrew is a history professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of Jim Crow's Last Stand, The Struggle for Civil Rights in the Suburban North. The story of civil rights is a story that we tell almost exclusively through the history of the South, beginning with the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, the one that struck down separate unequal education, or the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 that launched the remarkable career of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And it's a compelling story, but it's a story that overlooks um, both um, deeply entrenched racial segregation and discrimination in the North and overlooks the remarkable struggle of African Americans and interracial civil rights activists in the North to challenge inequality, Jim Crow, segregation north of the Mason-Dixon line. It's a story that's barely been told. Today at the eastern extremity of the state of Pennsylvania, a remarkable construction project is transforming the face of the countryside. The area below will, within the next two years, be the 10th largest city in the state of Pennsylvania. The early 1950s were a great time for most Americans. World War II was over, and millions of GIs had returned home to rebuild their lives with their families. Communities like Levittown, Pennsylvania were helping that dream come true, and from the outside seemed to be open to all. Construction is about to begin on several of 18 churches which will serve the people of Levittown. The city is donating the land on which these houses of worship will be built. That's exactly what William and Daisy Myers thought as they began looking for a larger home for their growing family. We had two boys and I was expecting and we just didn't have enough room. So we looked and looked and looked. We visited friends in Levittown one evening and they told us about the home next door to them that was empty, that was the Wexlers. Uh, the man who lived there had been transferred and they were going to put their home up for sale. So he asked if we would like to look at it and we did look at it and we liked it. It was the ranch, a ranch home with a garage and very nice shrubbery and everything was very nice about the home. So we were kind of sold on it right away. In many neighborhoods that African Americans moved into for the first time, White neighbors resisted, by any means necessary. They would picket, they would protest, um, they would often commit acts of vandalism uh, on the houses that African Americans were moving into. Trouble started, we moved in 1957, and uh, that's when the trouble started. The postman came to the door and asked to speak to the uh, owner of the home, and I said, I am the owner of the home. And he looked as though he had seen a ghost. And he backtracked and told all the people that he had delivered mail to that blacks had moved in. And within, within minutes or half hour or so, people started gathering down on the sidewalk in front of the home. And of course, by nightfall, it was, uh, had turned into a mob. Huge crowds gathered out in the streets in the front, shouting racial epithets, clashing with the police, um, all because a single African-American family attempted to move into what was uh, an all-white suburban community. And this was Levittown, Pennsylvania. This is suburban Philadelphia in the late 1950s. Um, the images uh, were images that you would associate with the Deep South, but they weren't. These were um, images and classic, quintessential post-war American suburbia. Um, Levittown was the epitome of the American dream of home ownership. Little, affordable houses that middle-class uh, Americans and working-class Americans could afford. Uh, and this, was, this, this neighborhood became one of the many intense battlegrounds over retaining the racial purity and racial homogeneity of uh, a white neighborhood. Walk with me Lord, walk with me. We heard from many sources that they were going to throw bombs through the windows, and um, we were expecting that to happen any time. Uh, they broke 
the windows in the the uh, kitchen dinette area, and we were. That's where I was standing before they broke the windows. But they had uh, promised us that, uh, you know, we would be bombed out. It was hard. Uh, every night we went to bed, we would sit on the side of the bed and tell each other how much we loved each other in case we didn't awake the next morning. And uh, he would always tell me, you know, we can leave if you want to leave. Uh, anytime you feel as though you can't take it, we'll leave. And he just made me feel as though I didn't have to stay if I didn't want to stay. It was an ordeal. They didn't burn a cross on our yard. That was one strange thing because we were kind of expecting it, you know. We had one lady call and said she would never give her children chocolate milk again as long as she lived. She was afraid they would turn black. <laughs> so we knew what kind of people we were dealing with from that phone call. And they offered us, we were offered like $500,000, $200,000, $250,000. We were offered all kinds of money, all large sums of money. And we, we asked someone, where is this money coming from? Somebody said leverage because we never were able to prove it. But they offered us large sums of money. Uh, I laugh now and say, where are those people now? <laughs> One thing to be said about Levittown is that, and this is true in communities in the North that resisted blacks moving in, there were whites who were supportive of the Myers, uh, of the first black family to move to Levittown. Um, the next door neighbors uh, were staunch supporters. They believed in racial integration. They were committed to it. Lou and B, they were very, very friendly towards us and very helpful. And, and their children, they had a boy and a girl. In many instances, they were treated worse than we were because they uh, wrote on their building and um, they tried to burn uh, uh, crosses in their yards. They were really treated badly. And in some cases, they, the people told us that they, they hated the Jewish people worse than they did us. But uh, they didn't let it bother them. They, they struggled through it. One of the other white Levittowners who supported the Myers family was Hal Leftcourt, who at the time was a local township commissioner. God bless you, young I'm lady. I'm so glad to see you. What a pleasure to see you again. <laughs> oh, God almighty. You're the I America love, we want. You. I love you. I cry every time I see you. Yeah. I can't help it. God bless you, young lady. Come on in, please. One person who was far less helpful was Jim Newell, the leader of the Levittown Betterment Association. He's the guy, Jim Newell, that southern, bigoted, no good Democrat. Me, a liberal Democrat, has to share being in a party with a punk like that. And he had that right, sir. He's still living in America, lived, lived in my ward. And he's telling me as his commissioner to get her the hell out. Can he do that in my country? What am I, crazy? Newell came to our house before we moved and asked us to vote for him. He ran for one of the political offices there in the township. And my husband said, you know, I'm surprised that you would come here and ask us to vote for you. He said, well, I only did what they wanted me to do. We took Mrs. Myers and Mr. Leftcourt back to Levittown, to the house filled with so many memories and a neighborhood that had definitely changed. And the crowds were all, all along the walkway and on the street and all along here. I thank the Lord for letting me live long enough to come back. I don't hate anyone, and I wish them all well. And for some reason, they must have had a reason for not wanting us to be there just simply because of our skin color. But 
I think they missed out on something by not getting to know us. And uh, I just pray for them. The late Dr. Edna McKenzie was the first African-American woman to graduate with a PhD in history from the University of Pittsburgh. She was an author, educator, and devotee of Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Negro History Week, now nationally known as Black History Month. However, she started her career as a 17-year-old reporter for the Pittsburgh Courier, working with legendary photographer Teenie Harris. And then I guess the Pittsburgh Courier was my first just an exciting experience. I was about 17 when I went in the home office, and I grew up in that home office, doing a lot of everything, just about everything. Uh, I did reporting. Uh, Teeny and I worked together all the time. Uh, during the war years, I was working with the Double V campaign. I wrote copy, I wrote headlines, I edited, I did everything uh, at the Pittsburgh Courier, and that was um, a great opportunity because there was not a day on which some great person didn't come up those steps. And I think one of the reasons, it, it got commonplace, you know, you knew that A. Philip Randolph might come today and Thurgood Marshall tomorrow, Mary McLeod, Claude Bethune the next day or Lena Horne, they were always there. So you were in an atmosphere of black people who were great and of course you had to be ambitious around people like that. One of her earliest and most challenging assignments was confronting Western Pennsylvania's Jim Crow practices head on. Well, I went in the restaurants and I almost got literally spat upon. That is the truth. They insulted you. I remember one restaurant and it was in uh, McDonald or Clariton, one of the little towns. And I asked for a cup of coffee. And the coffee urn, great big coffee urn, sitting right on the counter and cups everywhere and people sitting around drinking coffee. They told me, we don't have any. And then I said, but you do have some and I'd just like to have a cup. Well, if you lived around here, you'd know better. We don't serve Negroes. And so you're, you know, obviously your best bet is to get out of here. Well, of course, Teeny had to take picture of the establishment and all that. He didn't go in uh, all the time. But those kinds of things I had to do. And I had to do it for about six weeks. And uh, Mr. Prattis, who was the executive editor then, told me, you know, you have to jump in the fire. <laughs> in other words, you know you're going to get burned, but you jump in anyway. And um, now as I think about it, it was very important to do that because then we could sue them, and then they would have to open up their restaurants for black people. People think it started down in North Carolina, the sit-ins. Pittsburgh had sit-ins going on in the 40s. And there were lots of black and white young people together. And on my particular assignment, I was alone, but it was going on all over the city. We broke down the uh, segregation. Although Pennsylvania had an equal rights law passed in 1935, nobody obeyed the law. They didn't even know the law and didn't want to learn it. Um, that's the thing that always am amazes me about America, how Americans, we're so lawless. I mean, the general population, don't pay attention to laws. You know they never paid any attention to the 14th Amendment or there would never have been a need for the 60s. Having to go out and uh, be actually hurt. I cried myself to sleep every night after I went out. I mean, nobody can take that kind of stuff. You know that you are, you know, there's nothing nasty or dirty or ugly about you, but you have to let people say those things to you when you're going on a story. You have to stand there and listen to it. And you have to understand that you're doing it for a reason. And no matter the fact that you know when you leave the office that you're going somewhere to get insulted, you must go. Because that's the only way you get the evidence to say that it happened. And then they had to be sued in order to make them obey the law. All of this was going on during the early 1940s when black men were helping fight fascism overseas in World War II. Dr. McKenzie fought the Battle of Jim Crow on the home front. 
The Courier called it the double V campaign for victory overseas and here at home. Our men were overseas fighting in a segregated army, uh, but they were being uh, treated equally by the French and Italians and other Europeans. But Americans, you know, still were not treating our men right. We all know the stories of the great triumphs of the 99th Pursuit Squadron and our men uh, who finally got their medals of honor 50 years late. However, our men were willing to do that for America. But we were being treated equally at home. And so our mission was to try to win some battles at home. And one was to get the respect that we deserved in our own communities. And uh, public accommodations were supposed to serve everybody, every citizen. The laws protected us, but the laws were not enforced. Have you been a good little nigga? Have you said yes sir, yes ma'am? Of the many evils perpetrated against African Americans during the past century, lynching was the most violent and horrible. Though the exact numbers of victims are impossible to verify, a Tuskegee Institute report states that 4,730 people were lynched in the United States between 1882 and 1951. Of these, 3,437 were black, and though most occurred in the South, 46 of the 50 states in this country have witnessed these reprehensible crimes. Coatesville, Pennsylvania is in many ways a typical American small town. However, on a Sunday afternoon in 1911, Zachariah Walker, a black steel worker, was pulled from his hospital and burned alive. Leroy Carter Sr. is a native of Coatesville and a former Negro League baseball player. You want to talk about that one? You know He's also an artist whose work hangs in a small museum adjacent to his home and focuses on Jim Crow and its impact on blacks. Have you been a good little nigga? Do you bow down to King James? Have you been? Everything right For many of the people we interviewed, the murder of Zachariah Walker is a difficult subject. My dad and Mr. Walker uh, knew each other well. And it hurts to talk about that stuff. It hurts to talk about it particularly someone that thought that anything like that would ever happen in a city less than. Yeah. But it did happen. They burn him, that's all. Terrific man, terrific athlete. But they stuck it to him, like they did any other place in this, in this, in this, uh, I really, I really don't like to talk about it myself, but, uh, oh my. This is the Coatesville Hospital building as it looks today. The mob that lynched Zachariah Walker rushed up these very stairs and despite pleas from the hospital staff, dragged Zach out to his gruesome fate. To understand exactly what happened, we talked to a man who has researched the case, Mike Geary, the director of the Coatesville Public Library. Zachariah Walker was a steel worker at the Bethlehem Steel Company here in town. And 
Uh, he was identified as the murderer of a steel company policeman. And uh, on a weekend, uh, he fled the scene and he was pursued by a posse and eventually captured in a wounded condition and he was placed in the local Coatesville Hospital. A large lynch mob of some 2,000 people came and took him away from the hospital, crossed two township lines, and then they proceeded to burn him to death. He was burnt alive. He died in the fire. As far as I know, it's probably the single most terrible thing that's ever happened in this community. I've read a number of eyewitness accounts. Many people were there, many people over the course of time have recalled those particular events. And there's certainly some, some legends and rumors of what went on, but the newspaper coverage uh, indicated that a, uh, a number of individuals were identified as the primary motivators of the lynching, uh, maybe 12 or 15 of them. They were all put on trial and they were all exonerated at trial. None of them were found guilty. The lynching of Zack Walker would not go unnoticed and brought an unwelcome focus to Coatesville. There was talk of revoking the town's charter. The kinds of attention they got. President Teddy Roosevelt heard about it and of course uh, condemned the action outright as something that was, you know, unacceptable behavior. Especially in the North, I guess we would say. Uh, at the time, I think, uh, the country felt that perhaps lynchings occurred in the South, but not up here in the North. And in fact, that's not true. Before widespread automobile ownership and the emergence of commercial airlines, there was a time, from the late 1800s until the 1950s, when Americans traveled almost exclusively by train. The majority of passenger cars operating during this time, like this fully restored one seen here at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, were owned by the Pullman Palace Car Company and its president, George Pullman. The service workers aboard these trains were known as Pullman Porters. Almost exclusively male and African Americans, the porters were an integral part of the railroad business. By the 1920s, over 20,000 African Americans were working for the Pullman Company as porters and other train personnel. Kurt Bell is the archivist for the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. Pullman porters on average um, in 1931 that worked 8,000 hours a year would earn on average $77.50 a week. So that was a very good paying job. At its height, the Pullman Company would offer accommodations to over 35 million people a year, which would require the employment of over 9,000 Pullman porters. So um, it was a fairly pervasive position um, in the black community. Uh, it also afforded probably um, more working opportunities than you would get at another line of work. Oftentimes, a, a Pullman porter would work uh, in the lounge of the car. Uh, it was his duty basically to wait on passengers. He would serve the meals, pour the drinks. He would also provide the silverware, set up the table with the silver service and the china service. A lot of times he would lay down napkins, matchbooks, make sure that the menus were displayed prominently. If a passenger needed help, he would basically ring the buzzer that was equipped on the side of the car, and that would ring the porter in, and then of course he would uh, serve the passengers, uh, you know, whatever it was that they needed. It was also the Pullman porter's job, of course, to make up the sleeping berths. Uh, he would have to basically arrange all the sheets and the blankets according to the company's very strict policies, which were in writing, that he was expected to follow at all times. Pullman porter literally had to know the number of inches that he had to fold a sheet onto the blanket. He also had to pour the drink so that the, the, um, the drink, the beverage, was at a certain height, for instance. Uh, the Pullman porter also had to be um, proficient at cleaning clothes, pressing suits. Uh, he was also uh, expected to shine shoes on board the car. 
uh, help passengers on board the train, also alight from the train. He had to be expected to be familiar with the mechanical and refrigeration systems on board the car. So the Pullman Porter literally did everything. Musical today, referring to Walt Harper's life. Harold Hayes is a veteran reporter for KDK TV in Pittsburgh. His grandfather, Thomas Burrell, was a Pullman Porter on the Pennsylvania Railroad. He ran on the Pennsylvania Railroad and his longest run for 13 years was Pittsburgh to Detroit. He told me that the people who had the most money for the longest time were the nicest people to him. The people who had just made their money or were just still aspiring to make their money treated him like dirt. And a lot of times Pullman Porters got stuck with the passenger's children, especially when the wife would go ahead into the buffet car. It was up to the Pullman Porter to have to watch over the unruly children that were left behind. Um, and a lot of times white passengers were very condescending on the black Pullman Porters, um, which um, there was a lot of indignity that was associated with that whole era. He never really got into a lot of the specifics about what happened or some of the things that he went through. But he made it clear to me that he, he could tell a person's upbringing by the way they treated him. And you can imagine uh, the issue of shining shoes or making their beds. There were a lot of opportunities for him to be, or for people to try to make him feel subservient. A lot of times Pullman Porters were called George uh, because of their employee by George Pullman, who was the president of the Pullman Company until the turn of the century. That became a, um, a racist term that was used by white passengers whenever they would call a Pullman porter in for service. Oftentimes they would say, George, I need you to come over here and get me a towel, or George, I need you to look after my children while I, I go ahead in the dining car. I don't think many people called my grandfather George. He was a big man. <laughs> a. Philip Randolph was a newspaper publisher who saw the need for organization amongst the porters. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters was founded in 1925. They were the first black labor union to ever sign a collective bargaining agreement with a large U.S. corporation. I saw a movie not long ago and it inspired me to go back up into the boxes and look for his Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters union badge. I couldn't find it. <laughs> I know it's up there somewhere. But all of those things, um, I'm, I'm proud that he was part of that. So when I look at documentaries like that, I, uh, I know my grandfather was in there as well. They proved to be a very powerful network for grassroots labor and civil rights organizing. Why? Because the train stopped in every town and they served as connectors. They carried information, they got out and they would stay in the local um, black YMCA or stay in local um, boarding houses and hotels. They'd meet people from other towns and they'd convey information about what was happening. During the Great Migration, World War II, and other events that affected the nation's black population, the Pullman Porters would act as couriers. They would smuggle African-American newspapers like the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier into the South and other areas where blacks were forbidden access to these so-called inflammatory publications. Operation of the Pullman Company's sleeper cars ceased in 1968. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters represented its members until 1978 when it merged with the Brotherhood of Railway and Airline Clerks. A. Philip Randolph died a year later at the age of 90. Jim Crow affected nearly every facet of African American life. And according to Dr. McKenzie, this was no accident. They knew what they were doing, and I, I'm afraid it's the same thing today. If you put blacks in inferior schools, you give them teachers that are not prepared, you do not give them the latest technology, you are deliberately, and I say it's not a mistake or, or just coincidental, they are deliberately making sure you will not be prepared to participate on equal grounds. 
And then, of course, you go into, um, we'll say, other kinds of activities to make a living. Then they say you're no good. You see, they have to prove that you're worthless. And in order to do it, they have to set it up. Nowhere was Jim Crow more evident than when blacks entered the workplace. And at one time, there was no bigger workplace in Pennsylvania than the steel mills. The steel industry had a lot of very difficult and dangerous jobs. And there was almost a direct correlation between how dangerous, dirty, and unpleasant the job was and how many African Americans you'd find in it. The worse the job, the more likely you were to find black workers there. Um, working in front of the furnace, doing foundry work, um, hot, really unpleasant, dangerous work, um, you'd find black workers concentrated there. Despite the advice of his parents, Oliver Montgomery, like Robert Allen and so many others, followed the men in their families into the mill. Yeah, it's labor. That was the lowest, lowest paying job in the mill. Labor gang. Everybody worked in the steel industry. And so I went in there uh, not too long after coming out of high school. My parents didn't want me to go. They, they always said there's so much discrimination, things are so horrible, the jobs for the black people are so terrible. Don't go near that mill. Go to school, get your education, and keep away from the mill. But there was nothing else to do if you wanted to make any money. Jim Crow in the North wasn't too much different than it was in the South. And my dad and my uncles, you know, they, they worked in the coke plant, which as we call, you know, a human destruction job, man killing job, the fumes, the gas, everything. I noticed we had to do all the hard and hot work in the open hearth, work in the body of the furnaces, work in the check, what they call the checkers, crawl down in the flues, something about three feet high and clean those out and all the hot and nasty work we had to do though. They, we had to do that mostly. They had a black labor gang and a white labor gang. And the black labor gang cut, did most of the dirty hard work. Bottom of the rung jobs, uh, African American workers were usually confined there. And in the steel industry, there were often separate lines of seniority, which meant that if you're a white person, you could keep moving up the ranks. The more seniority you got, the more chance you had to transfer into other jobs. Many African American workers had dead end seniority lines. To paint a picture, where blacks were in 1948, uh, we had the, the entire industry was classified. You had job description classified. You had anywhere from 30 to 32 different classifications, different levels. Job class one was the lowest paid, and job class 32 and later on 33 were the highest paid jobs. Primarily the blacks was uh, one, two, three, and four. If you were black and you were on job class four, which at that time was uh, where I started, was what you call a, a labor, a bricklayer labor, uh, that's where you were. And it was hard to break out of that. I never saw a white guy work in the body of a furnace. I never saw a white guy work in the cinder pits. We did all that work. And every so often those furnaces would burn out and blacks were used to go in and clean those furnaces out. Now you can imagine just, uh, I look at firemen sometime with all the protection they have. Well, blacks used to wear uh, bratted leggings, asbestos leggings, uh, goggles, uh, uh, wooden shoes about three inches thick. You know, you, that's what you had to put on to, you know, like a spaceman to go in there to clean out that red hot front and dig out those red hot bricks. That's the job you had. But you can only work a few minutes. Many people, you know, passed out. You know, it, it was a horrible, it was a horrible job. You had a, a wooden shoe you strapped onto your, you know, your steel toe shoes. And you had to get up in there and maybe the furnace is down maybe two days. And heat be jumping up your pants and lagging you up there with a jackhammer. <laughs> and it was really, it was hot, and we seen checkers, I seen furnaces go down where the checkers were so hot, we had to run, put an asbestos hood over our head, run in and grab a few brick and run out. See, the rule was those furnaces were supposed to have been down three, anywhere three days to a week 
before they would send anyone in those hot furnaces or up under the ground like groundhogs to clean that flu dust out. But this eager bigger foreman, I think, uh, I think it was one day, and he sent a bunch of guys down there. One guy went down up under the furnace, come out. This is why I closed the place down. You know, he took his goggles off and his skin came out with it. That's, that's the kind of work he used to do, you know. And he said, you should be glad for it, yeah. You could have all the seniority you wanted, and that helped you. It protected your job. But you couldn't take that seniority and use it to move into another um, safer, cleaner, uh, uh, less unpleasant uh, job because you were stuck in a, in a cul-de-sac in a dead end, uh, in a job that was defined as a black job. Um, and so um, that uh, um, meant that uh, there, was, there were very significant you know, differences in quality of work life for black and for white workers in, in, the, in steel as in many other heavy industries. They wouldn't let you help a fitter well, the only thing we could do would work in, a, in really would work in a riveting gang, or janitor was black, you know, or maybe you could help on some machines. But uh, if a man said he didn't want you, he don't want to work with you. You could he, you couldn't work when the boss wouldn't even put it. In. It made you know make you look back and say, what good is education anyhow, you know? I mean, they're educated, but it's still racism. If you asked a foreman to put you with a, with a fitter, and to, in order to work with a fitter, you had to know how to tack well. So we asked you, can you tack well? No, I can't tack well. Well, you can't do the job. He's going to make sure that you don't learn how to tack well, too. But blacks just didn't take that treatment lying down. They fought back. The battle had many fronts. We really were going to We took blood oaths with each other. We, we, we had to read the riot act to them just like they read to us, you know. Even the civil rights movement, like I could say, we, we fought a dual, or dual battle. Uh, I should say a triple battle. We fought for integration within the union. We fought for integration in the, in the community. And we fought for integration in the company. It's difficult to get people to buck the status quo. I used to put my car in a parking lot, maybe a hundred cars there. When I came out and eat it, my car would be there by itself because the guys would tell me that we think your car gonna go up in there anytime, you know. And they had a joke out about me. They said, I paid, I'll pay anyone a hundred dollars to start my car. So that, that's what we were up against. And a lot of mafia oriented there and a lot of it crept in and they, they would threaten you, you know. And we would threaten them back. So, you know, okay, fine. You got a baby sister too, so, <laughs> you know, so you threaten us, you know, if something happens to my buddy, I'm gonna get your buddy. And th that's the only thing they understood. Once we got organized, we had to watch out for each other because it was constant threat, you know. One of the threats we got is that if you go behind a furnace, you know, they make those big steel ladles, if we catch any of you behind, we're going to throw you in a hot ladle of steel. You're going to be nothing but a puff. It was a job, you know, it was a job where you could uh, make, a, make a decent living, you know. And I guess we were conditioned <laughs> to accept that. And yes, they were conditioned. Uh, in fact, uh, even today, there are people still conditioned, you know, for Jim Crow. But we had to get through to them. Well, we had to show them that progress was possible. Ava Randolph said it. The message that he drilled in our head, you're only going to get what you can take and you're going to keep what you can hold. The other side of the union movement was one of um, ethnic solidarity and exclusion so that many unions became, you could say, almost sort of hiring halls um, that relied on personal connections and personal references so that a white person uh, uh, would recommend a friend for a job, recommend someone they lived with, re re recommend someone um, from their extended family, recommend someone they went to school or to church with, or someone they got to know sitting around in a neighborhood bar. Well, um, through, through most of the, the 20th century, African Americans and whites lived in separate neighborhoods. Uh, they attended separate churches. Um, they went to separate schools. 
Um, they drank in separate bars, uh, and they certainly didn't intermarry uh, or have uh, uh, um, uh, family connections. So as a result, there were large sectors of the workplace, uh, many jobs that uh, systematically excluded African Americans because they weren't part of the networks um, that uh, unions relied on um, and employers relied on to hire. By taking active part in the CBTU and organizations, we were able to break it down. We were able to fight a battle to move blacks up in the local unions, move them up in the district. Many blacks went on the staff. We were able to make the union form a complete comprehensive civil rights department with a full-time director staff and have representatives all over the country. That, that's what we were able to do and, and uh, it changed quite a bit. On your mark, get set, hula hoop, hula hoop, hula hoop, keep up, put it down, cut up, get it all up, get it all up, all right, keep going, hula hoop, hula hoop, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, we got more, help us down. Oh, it was wonderful to come here as a kid because we were limited to the places that we could go in the city, and here it was like free. We had a swimming pool when I was a kid here, and you would bring your skates, and we would go down and go skating at the uh, barn. In a suburb not far from Pittsburgh, Fairview Park has been serving the African-American community when no one else would for over 60 years. Oh, look at you with those pretty eyes. Barbara Calloway is a retired okay. teacher Everybody who has fond memories of Fairview Park. Hi, how are you? Hi. Are you having a good time? Fairview I Park existed because of Jim Crow, but within its protected environment, kids never felt its brutal effects. You didn't deal with that at all. You knew things that you could or could not do. However, when you came out to Fairview Park, you had an opportunity to interact with other churches and people from all uh, the Mon Valley and the Pittsburgh area. And it was just a good fellowship time. Amusement parks, dance halls, and swimming pools were real battlegrounds over racial segregation. White folks did not want to be in dance halls, in roller rinks, uh, in places where they were semi-clad and wearing bathing suits uh, and swimming, they did not want to be near African Americans. They were afraid of the risk and possibility and danger of racial mixing, especially of young people, of teenagers. In the 1950s, Pittsburgh activists challenged uh, segregation in many of the amusement parks uh, and the public swimming pools um, in the city and in the surrounding areas. One of those who challenged the status quo was the Reverend J. Harold Hayes, the pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church. His son recalled the fight. The prevailing practice apparently was that African American churches could come to Kennywood and have their picnics there, but they could not use the pool nor could they use the dance hall. And it says here in this article that uh, once the heads of Kenny Wood were asked about it, they were told that the prevailing practices would apply, that they could use any of the facilities other than the swimming pool and the dance hall. And the article mentions that my father and others said that a stand needed to be taken, and so the ministers of the McKeesport Ministerial Association, which was interracial, it was the Catholics, the Protestants, the um, white churches, the black churches, uh, he was part of this organization, but he and some of the other African-American ministers said to the Ministerial Association, we should take a stand here and say that this isn't right, and they did. Now, I'm not certain, being the age I was uh, growing up, how this eventually was resolved. We know in this generation that's not an issue, 
but the common thought was that eventually um, there was no longer a pool at Kennywood, and maybe that's how it was resolved. I'm not certain. But it was, it, it's something that I've always shared with young people that perceive that Jim Crow was just an issue in the South, when indeed it was an issue here as well. <laughs> Ernest Jackson is the president of the Fairview Park Association. So in 1945, they bought this piece of property out here in Salem Township in Delmont, 100 acres at first. And it was a full-fledged amusement park with merry-go-rounds, roller coaster, swimming pool, and all the activities one will find in any other park. So that's what was the beginning. It's more or less from the fact that uh, the Jim Crow, Crow laws of the time was not allowing blacks to uh, uh, go into parks where whites were uh, owned by whites. On your mark, get set, go! Today, we don't have the amusement rise. Uh, over the years, with the elimination of the Jim Crow laws, uh, the blacks were going to the more modern parks, uh, like the uh, Kenny Wood and Westview Park, and the support for this park kind of dwindled to the point where they could not sustain the, uh, the equipment uh, for safety reasons. So over the time, all the equipment was eventually eliminated from the park. There you go. Great. Yeah. Today the park is used mainly for picnics, um, reunions, different churches used for different events they have uh, here at the park. And it's still a full it's functional park, but not as an amusement park. <laughs> Lawrence Mason of Delmont, Pennsylvania, describes himself originally as a city boy from Pittsburgh, but he had his reasons for moving to the suburbs. I've been involved totally since about 1948. The young lady that I was courting at that particular time, her father was on the board of trustees for the park and that's how I uh, became familiar with uh, Fairview Park. I was living in Pittsburgh at the time uh, in Homewood and uh, we used to come out with him to uh, cut the grass and do odds and ends, uh, you know, get on the good side of the father-in-law, you know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, that relationship sort of developed to the point that uh, we eventually uh, got married. At that time, the park had a uh, restaurant built, uh, building on the park, uh, which had an apartment upstairs above that. Um, we lived in the apartment and uh, uh, you know, sort of took care of the grounds. The vision, they were really far-sighted. Few individuals, I think, with no funds, with no resources, were able to you know, acquire this land and close to uh, almost 200 acres. I think we owe a lot to them. But to Barbara Calloway and many others, Fairview Park is still very important. I think this is important because we own this land. Now we own it. We didn't always own it, but uh, we own it now. And land is an important thing to own. It gives you a sense of uh, who you are. We all should own a piece of ground. If you don't have anything but a flower pot <laughs> with some dirt in there, everyone needs to own some land. And I try to impress upon the young people, this belongs to you. So therefore, when we're not here any longer, you will have to be the steward of this property. Is, are you enjoying your hot dog? Is it good? Good. Americans, especially white Americans, tend to look toward the future. Let's forget about the past. What's past is past. That's gone. And let's look forward instead to change and to progress. But we have to confront the troubled and unresolved past if we want to move forward and progress. You can't just pretend that history didn't happen. Uh, you can't pretend that it doesn't have ongoing consequences. It's there. It matters. It continues to shape and constrain uh, people's lives and people's opportunities and choices right up to the here and now. If it's knowledge, we don't care where it comes from. But more important, we don't need to put anybody down. And I honestly believe that if this information gets out, everybody will be happy. It must be burdensome to carry a load of hatred or 
um, a segregationist attitude or the need to discriminate against people or to treat them unfairly, un unequally. That must be a burden. The Mason-Dixon line was the traditional boundary between North and South. It's a reminder that Pennsylvania is a lot closer to the South than we think it is. Pennsylvania's history has much more in common with the history of Virginia, North Carolina, Mississippi than most of us Pennsylvanians care to admit. Welcome to the colored section. Welcome to the Negro League. Sign your name on a blacklist and know this. It's American history. See what it is to be black male. See a real life conspiracy. Sign your name on a black list and know this. It's American history. This program was made possible by a grant from the Pennsylvania Public Television Network. The network receives funding from the Commonwealth to provide public television to all Pennsylvanians and by viewers like you. Thank you.